Hello, sir. Uh, I I hope the auditorium is visible to you now. Hello. Yes, I can see the auditorium. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, I guess we can wait for a couple of more minutes because I guess uh, some people are joining, preferably joining online on Zoom or YouTube. It's, okay. it's okay with me. Whenever you are ready, you let me know. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, sir. Thank you. YouTube stream monitor कर रहा हूँ मतलब वरना HR का बात कर रहा हूँ इनकेस क्या प्रॉब्लम है तो माला HR का ही करता है ना ना मैं कैसे भेजूँ मैं स्ट्रीम कर रहा हूँ ठीक है Can you confirm if you can share your screen and uh, turn on your video as well? Like, yes, I'll do that in a minute. Yeah. Video is visible. Yes, sir. We can see you. Video is visible now. Yes, sir. You are, you are visible. Uh, if you can see Let me the share the screen. Yeah. Should I share the screen now? Yeah. yeah. We, we just, just wanted to check it once so that. Yes. Let Let me do that once. Video is visible. Yeah. So, can you see it's half screen now, right? Yes, yes, sir. We can see, see your screen. screen. Okay, no. So this is PowerPoint. So let me make it full screen, and let's see if you see it as full screen. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Is yes, it full sir. screen now? Yes, yes sir. sir. We can see the, see the full screen. You get your red curtain. Yes, yes sir. We can see the, see the screen. Yeah. It's clear. Okay. Yes, so, so I'll stop sharing now. Yes, sir. And uh, when you when you are ready, I'll share again. Yeah, Seems sir. to be working fine. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Okay. आगे थोड़ा सा अब और 15 सेकंड चलाएंगे एक लाइव में और यूट्यूब में अराउंड 15 सेकंड चलाएंगे
अनुजा तो यूट्यूब देखते रहे सोलह लोग हैं यूट्यूब हेलो एवरीवन सो देर इफ योर फ्रेंड्स आर विलिंग टू जॉइन यू ऑडिटोरियम प्लीज आस्क देम टू कम एस सुन एस पॉसिबल वी विल बी स्टार्टिंग इन अ कपल ऑफ मिनट्स सो या इट वुड बी अ ग्रेट Also, a gentle request to everyone: kindly wear your mask, mask for the whole time. Don't remove it just because you are in the auditorium. We need to maintain all the guidelines very strictly. Or and all the people sitting in the second half, please, if you are fine, join us in the first half. That would be better. We have a lot of empty seats in the first half. There seems to be a raised hand already. Is it by accident or? Oh yeah, it seems to be by accident. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, hello everyone. So we will be starting with the event now. So I welcome you all for the inaugural lecture of the Model Solve Conference 2021. So the Model Solve Conference is uh, is an annual event. Uh, conceptualized by the people in Iser B, like especially the students of Physics Club, and it's usually a two-day conference event in which people and participants, especially students from undergraduate courses, uh, discuss uh, their solutions and theories about fundamental questions posed by the organizing team, and the questions are mainly focusing on the. Uh, understanding of physics which they have learned right from their high school days to the early undergrad years and not focusing on uh, very high fi and mathematically intensive stuff so that's the main aim of the event and this is now as all of us in i hope bopan know this is the third edition of the model solve conference and the earlier conference has focused on topics ranging from the importance of fundamental constants like the planck constant to something as modern as and as intensive as the anion statistics in recent years so this year we have tried to reach out to institutes other than iser bhopal as well and make it an inter college event so this year uh, the problem would be focusing on another fundamental aspect of uh, physics which professor gavi would later say uh, So yeah, we hope that all the in participants from different institutes in the country enjoy this event, and you in Iser Bhopal also enjoy the event a lot. And we hope that this is a very good start to the Model Solve Conference 3.0. So now I would like to invite Professor Rajiv Gavai to introduce our speaker for the event. Yeah, round of applause for Professor Gavai. Pandra second. Good evening, everybody, and uh, good to see uh, interest in such a novel idea. Let me begin by actually congratulating the Iser Bhopal students and the organizers of this year in particular for thinking about this idea of uh, model solve conferences. I think it's something which is extremely unique. I found. especially since it tries to drag you away from the standard routine of quizzes and tests and exams and makes you think about something i have seen the problem which is given this year 
And I found that interesting. I hope all of you are trying to track this uh, and get the solution. The theme this year is on the binarity of the charge and asking the question, what if this binarity of the charge is not going to be true in the nature? Clearly, that would have consequences starting from undergraduate electrodynamics to particle physics. And the idea is to somehow try to explore if somebody discovers this experimentally, or how would you discover this experimentally if it is true theoretically? And so I find that theme extremely exciting and very, very uh, uh, creative in nature. Professor Srirup Raichudari from Theoretical Physics Department of TIFR is clearly the best person for uh, motivating on this thing because he works on precisely these kinds of things. He works on electroweak physics and he also works on the ideas of physics beyond what exists in the experiments or theory of play or beyond standard model physics. I know Sirup since the time uh, I came to know of his reputation first as a very brilliant student of Calcutta University working with Professor Amitabh Rai Chaudhary and he really uh, uh, kept his uh, promise of the reputation, went on to come, uh, get his PhD from there and uh, did his postdoctoral work in PIFR and later on in CERN. He was then a, a professor at IIT Kanpur and uh, in the last decade or so, he has been working at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in the Department of Theoretical Physics. As I said, he is an uh, expert in this particular kind of area. And more importantly, he is also a very, very well known for giving excellent talks, which are really uh, captivating. And so in terms of motivation, I'm pretty sure he will do a fantastic job. So I hope you can enjoy the treat. And uh, I will be very happy to welcome Professor Sriru Prachadari to this function in ISR Bhopal. Professor Sriru Prachadari, please. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, so, yeah, I guess we can start with the talk. So, uh, Professor Sriru Prachadari, uh, I guess you can take over. Yeah. So let me share the screen first and see that it's coming. Okay, then we'll. Uh, is the screen visible? Yes, sir. Half a screen? Yes. Yeah. Now full screen? Yes, sir. yes, sir. It's visible. Okay. So shall I start then? Yes, sir. You can start. Okay. L let me start uh, by thanking Ameb in particular for contacting me and the organizers of this program for inviting me to give this talk. It's always a pleasure to talk about one's own subject and especially to bright young minds. I'd also like to thank Professor Gawai Rajiv for the very warm introduction you gave me and to remind you that we now know each other for 32 years. And that's probably more than the age of most of the people who are listening to this talk. Anyway, thank you very much. So without ado, let me uh, start the talk. So the my topic will be developing the standard model. So I will talk about the standard model of physics and I will talk about how this model developed. I'm not going to assume a lot of prior knowledge, but essentially the knowledge you have in your higher secondary or bachelor's should be enough to understand. I will also talk about the physics ideas and not go into any of the mathematics or the technicalities. If you have technical questions, uh, please feel free to ask them also at the end. And uh, I suppose questions at the end? Or should we have questions in between? Anyway, please ask them at the end. So, uh, I would be happy to Hello. answer. Yes. Should we have questions at the end? At the end. At the end. Yes. Okay. So please feel free to ask technical questions if you want at the end, yeah. and I'll answer you so far as I'm able. Of course, Professor Gawa is also the, around to uh, help you. So uh, it's an expert in many, many things. But uh, for the bulk of the talk, I will not be not not make it technical. So this is. Uh, let me first introduce you to the standard model. It's a model of the fundamental particles. So which are the fundamental particles? There are 
two bunches of particles, one set which are called leptons and one set which are called quarks. This is what we know today. So the leptons consist, as you see on the left here, of three neutrinos, uh, the electron, the muon, and the tau neutrino, and three charged leptons called the electron, muon, and the tau, or e mu tau. And similarly, there are quarks which go with the labels U, D, C, S, D, and B. Sometimes we give them fancy full names, and I'll mention some of them as we go along. Now, these are the particles of what we call matter. They are all fermions, they are spin half particles, and none of them is actually uh, demanded to exist by the others. However, once these particles are there, they interact between themselves. And the particles which carry those interactions are this bunch of particles. So there is a set of, first let's look at the bottom, there is a set of eight particles called the gluons, which are all separate particles carrying different quantum numbers, and they mediate something called the strong interaction, which I will talk about. Then there are the four particles, which mediate electroweak interactions. In particular, the photon is the one you are familiar with. There are also the W minus, the W plus, and the Z. And in addition to this, there is one more part. So all of these particles have spin one. And finally, there is one particle, which is the last, which is to have joined this. And that is the Higgs boson, which was discovered as late as 2012. And I will talk about that towards the end of my talk. So this bunch of particles, as you see here, six plus six, 12, and four, 16, and eight, 24, and five. So these 25 particles, are what form the standard model. Now, before I tell you what they do in the standard model, let us see how these discoveries was made, how we came to know that these exist. So let's look at the earliest discoveries. You've heard of them, you've seen some of them, but still it's good to hear them again. So the very first to be discovered was the electron. As you know, in 1897, Sir J. J. Thompson discovered the electron and you see here a small picture of the actual apparatus with which he did this. I know because I took this photograph myself. It's preserved at Cambridge in the Cavendish Museum. The label here says this is the actual instrument used by Sir J. J. Thompson to discover the electron and you probably all studied this at some stage in your school or college. Then by 1911 Ernest Rutherford did his famous experiment. Again, this is the real apparatus he used, called the gold foil experiment. Basically, the gold foil is put into this object. The rest of it is basically holds a uh, generator well for particles. And with the help of that, he was able to discover the nucleus. And the lightest nucleus is the proton. So in some sense, he was able to discover the proton. Now, this part was completed by the discovery by Shadwick, and this is the instrument again which he used there, called the neutron. He discovered a particle called the neutron. So the electron, proton, and neutron were the first three elementary particles which were discovered. And I will I'll use this convention throughout. The particles which are positively charged will have this reddish orange. Uh, particles negatively charged will have this bright blue. And neutral particles will be white. So that's the charge of these particles electric charge. So, you know, we have this idea of the modern atom. What is the modern atom? There is a, there's a nucleus at the center, and then there are these protons and neutrons, which are sort of overlapping with each other, overlapping wave functions. And then there is a sort of fuzzy region around that, which are the orbitals, where the electrons can be found. The electrons are somewhere around this. We don't, the old idea of electrons going around in fixed orbits doesn't hold with quantum mechanics. But uh, we think of electrons as in these fuzzy fixed energy states around the nucleus. So the people who helped us to build up this idea are the following. Uh, Niels Bohr, who came up with the first idea of these, how to understand these states by applying quantum mechanics. And then Max Born, uh, Schrodinger, who gave his famous equation, wave equation, solving which gives us these. Max Born, who helped us to understand what is the meaning of the wave function, that these really fuzzy regions are fuzzy regions of probability. And finally, Dirac, who helped us to understand why the electron has a spin. But of course, there were many others who contributed to this. I can't show you all of them, but maybe I will show you some of the prominent people 
for different things as they go along. Now one question immediately arose regarding the nu nucleus. So if this is a blown up picture of that same nucleus, we have these positive charges and these neutral charges. Okay, so protons are all positive and they must be repelling each other. The neutrons are all neutrals, they neither attract nor repel. So why doesn't the force of repulsion between the protons cause the nucleus to fly apart? This is the question asked by Werner Heisenberg. You've heard of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, it's the same Heisenberg. In 1923, he asked, 32, he asked this question, and what holds the nucleus together? I mean, if you bring charges like that together, they will simply fly apart. What's happening? So he concluded that there must be a force of attraction between the nucleons, between the protons, and if, the, if it had not involved the neutrons, then the neutrons would simply drift away as the nucleus moved. So there must be a force which is sort of of mutual attraction between proton and proton, neutron and neutron, and so on. Question, how strong is this force? So let me do a simple calculation with you. So you know that the potential in a hydrogen atom between the electron and the potential energy between the electron and the proton is given by E squared by A naught, which is the Bohr radius, and that 4 pi epsilon naught, of course, is your unit. And we know that that value is 13.6 electron volts. We all know that, right? Well, for the nucleus, it will be the same. The force of repulsion between two protons will be proportional to the product of the proton charges divided by, let us say, some size of the nucleus. The distance between the protons to get an order of magnitude, which as all I have written here, you will need the size of the nucleus. So therefore, you could write this by just multiplying and dividing by the Bohr radius, A naught here. So this number we know, this is 13.6 electron volts, and you have the ratio between the Bohr radius and the nuclear size. So let's put in the actual numbers. So this is 13.6 electron volt. The typical Bohr radius is about uh, 10 to the minus 10 meters, that's not an angstrom. And the typical size of the uh, nucleus is about a femtometer or a fermi 10 to the minus 50 meters. So there is a clear factor of 10 to the 5 here. That is 1 lakh times. So if the energy the, which is the four, which is held by a, a electron held inside a proton, the one force between the protons is a lakh of times more. So that's actually around a mega electron volt, which is a million electron volts. Now, if you think of it, the ratio of this is roughly the ratio of the weight of a mouse. Okay, you don't have a mouse this big. But just think of this as a normal mouse. The weight of a mouse compared to the weight of a big SUV car. You know what happens if an SUV car goes over a mouse, right? So that tells you the ratio of forces between the atomic forces and the uh, nuclear forces. And remember that the atomic forces are what holds everything we see around us. Okay, when you see a great mountain, when you see the Himalayas, when you see Mount Everest, then Mount Everest is resting on atoms. And right at the bottom, there is a layer of atoms. And it's just the force between those atoms which holds up this entire mountain. So now imagine something which is one lakh times stronger. So, obvious name to give this, it's called the strong interaction. Okay, now, when you have interactions between particles, we know from quantum field theory that it comes because of exchange of particles. Now, let's try to understand that through this cartoon. So, let's see first. Electromagnetic force is due to the exchange of something called virtual photons between charged particles like protons. And these photons are also the quantum of the electromagnetic field. So, therefore, the theory of photons is also called quantum electrodynamics. But let's try to get the idea. Think of two skaters. You see these two stick figures. They are wearing skates. So, they are on a sheet of ice. And you see that they come close together to throw this ball. And then, because of this, this fellow recoils and this fellow moves back because of the momentum given to him by the ball. Now, suppose you couldn't see the ball. What would you see? You would see these two guys came close to each other then got repelled and moved back. So you would say there is a force of repulsion between these two guys 
and that is the force between the ether, just a force. So now imagine these two guys to be two protons. Okay, so when the virtual photon is exchanged between them, they move apart exactly like the two skaters. Okay, so the four protons are there, virtual photon goes there, and that just pushes it back just like that ball. So you imagine that these are happening. Of course, you can't see these virtual photons. That's why they're virtual, but they have the same role as the ball you're seeing. So, Yukawa, Japanese physicist, in 1935, he asked himself the question that, well, if that is happening for electromagnetic interactions, what about strong interactions? So, he studied the nature of the strong interaction and he concluded that they must be also due to the exchange of particles. The photon has a spin one, but he says these particles should be having zero spin, no spin, and the mass would be around 200 times the electron mass, unlike the photon, which has no mass. So he called them mesotrons, later it was shorted to mesons. Then it turned out there are many types of mesons. So these were known as pi mesons. Pi of course is the Greek P, so it stood for the proton mesons. And finally today we call them just pions. Okay. So people have grown more lazy over the years. Okay. So just as collisions between charged particles, what happens when charged particles collide? It leads to the emission of a lot of photons. And similarly, the collisions between nucleons can lead to emission of pions. So the proper place to look for them is in cosmic rays. And in fact, this is something most people do not know, that the first people to look for them in cosmic rays, to look for these pions in cosmic rays, were two Indian scientists, D.M. Bose of Bose Institute, and his student, Biva Chaudhary, who was one of the very first women to be actually doing research in physics in India. And these two people did this around the period 1938 to 1940s, around the time of the First World War, Second World War. Real pioneers. Now, why cosmic rays? So, let's learn a little about cosmic rays. So, cosmic rays were discovered by Victor Hess in 1912. And essentially what happens with cosmic rays, we understand this now, that a particle comes from the cosmos, from somewhere outside the Earth, highly high energy charged particle, it comes and hits the atmosphere, which means it hits a nucleus of oxygen or nitrogen, which is which are what make up the atmosphere. And when it hits that nucleus, there's a lot of energy in that. So with that energy, you know, because of E equal to MC squared, you can create new particles. So it creates more new particles. Those particles also have a lot of energy in the beginning. So they go and hit other nuclei. Those emit more particles. So eventually you have a shower of particles, such as the one simulated here. Okay, and this idea that it could be simulated like this, so here is a more detailed picture. Imagine the primary cosmic ray, which most of them come from the sun, but a lot of them come away from far off objects like supernovae, quasars, active galactic nuclei, and so on. Uh, so, suppose some of these come in its atmosphere, then it creates a bunch of particles. You see, one of, some of them go and then hit other nuclei and create more particles, and so on. So eventually you have things, you know, all kinds of cascades and so on, and a whole bunch of different kinds of particles which come out at the bottom. So this idea that you could create showers like that, again, there is an Indian name in this, Homi Bhabha, who was also the founder of our atomic energy program, founder of the institute where I work, and his collaborator Walter Heitler. So in 1936, they came up with this idea of showers of cosmic rays. And that turns out to be the right idea. We have been following it ever since. Well, let me talk about the actual discoveries of these mesons. Because though D.M. Bose and Biva Chaudhary did look for mesons, they did find some mesons. But there were more discoveries which came after that. So, the first people actually to see mesons, particles of around 105 MeV buses. Remember the electron is about half an MeV, so these are really around 200 times. So these were discovered by Anderson and Nedermeyer, and this is in fact one of the first tracks of a new meson which they saw. I'll tell you a little bit about tracks later, but uh, the first new mesons which they saw, which nowadays we have shot into muons. So they were the first to see this. Then another, then another, the actual pi mesons of Yukawa have mass around 140 mu. And they were discovered by a team headed by uh, Cecil Powell and uh, Giacomo 
or Shelley in 1947, so exactly 10 years later. Now you may ask, why did it take 10 years to do this discovery? Remember that in between came the Second World War, so all these scientists were called off to do war work, some to make their atom, atom bombs, some to do other kinds of work. Okay, so these are the two, two, the, 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 the two kinds of mesons. And this one matches all the characteristics of your cause meson. Incidentally, in this picture, let's take any one of them. This is the track left by the pion, this track is left by a neon, and this is left by an electron. So it had to be these little tracks which you had to see, not these long tracks, before you could see the pion. Now the question then comes about the muon. The pion was expected. Where did the muon come from? So Isidore Rabi, who is a Nobel laureate for something else. So Rabi, you see a stamp here with his head from the country he came from. So Rabi asked this question, who ordered that? We didn't ask for the muon. So that is a question in some sense which we still haven't been able to answer. It's just, just there. Okay, but we ask a different question. What prevents a proton, which of course interacts with pions, from decaying into a pi, positive pi and a neutral pi? The mass of the proton is about 938 MeV in, in energy units. The mass of this is about 140 and this is about 135. So a heavy object can of course decay into lighter objects, so why doesn't this decay happen? So what you should see is a proton decaying into a pair of pions. But this is never seen. In fact, if it had happened, remember, most we are made mostly out of water. So lots of protons inside us, anyway nuclei. So if protons started decaying, we would also decay into pions. That's not happening. So therefore, something must be preventing this decay. And the idea here, so as I've written down the message, you can see that this heavier object could easily have decayed to these light things. So this was pointed out by a gentleman called Stuckelberg in 1939. He said that the proton and every baryon, we'll come to baryons later, carries a conserved quantum number B equals 1, which is conserved. So now, since the pions are B equal to 0, the above decay is forbidden. So it's like a selection rule in atomic physics. The point is that if the proton has B equal to 1, the initial state has B equals 1, the final state will also have to have B equals 1. And since both of these have B equal to zero, this final state cannot happen. So therefore, a proton cannot decay to anything which doesn't have B equal to one. The point is that the proton is the lightest particle which has B equal to one. A one particle cannot decay into something heavier than itself. So that means that the proton cannot decay and it's not seen to decay either. So that's that was the idea due to Stuckel. Therefore, this number which is carried by the proton and also by other particles called baryons. It's called rather unimaginatively baryon number. So I talk about the 50s. You know, this is a timeline of the major discoveries in particle physics. And uh, it, it, the Higgs discovery is here in 2012. And then uh, it comes all the way up to 2021 some uh, exotic states discovered recently. But the time period I'm talking about is the sort of from the late 40s when the pion was discovered to the mid 60s. I'm calling it the fabulous 50s, as the 50s used to be called uh, to those who, who are excited about the music of those days. But the 50s, uh, uh, you see that there was a spate of discoveries of new particles. Here is the pion, then another particle called the K, the pi naught, the delta, sigma, all sorts of particles. Okay. Omega minus, eta, small omega, long series. The point is that with all these discoveries, we ended up with something, you know, when you discover many animals, what do you do? You put them in a zoo. So, and of course, in a zoo, there are different areas where you keep different kinds of animals. So let's look at the particle zoo, as it's called. And in a zoo, you see, you have these two different, definite kinds of things. The electrons, which are the small animals, and the hadrons, which are the big animals. So among the leptons, you have the very light ones. In a zoo, what have you? The very light animals, the ones which can fly in the air, which are the birds, so you have large bird cages. You also have smaller cages where you keep things like rabbits, guinea pigs, small animals, okay? 
Then there are the medium sized animals like deer, for example. And there will be a section where you keep the really heavy animals, okay? Like the rhinoceros, the elephants, the hippopotamus, and so on. So, among the particle zoo is also similar. Like the birds, you have, and of course, one thing we have to remember that in a zoo, you will also have lots of butterflies, very, very light ones. So, uh, in the particle zoo, your very things which are like birds, which are very, very light, are the neutrinos. The slightly heavier ones are these charged leptons. Then you have these hadrons, which are the medium heavy ones, the pi plus minus, pi naught, and so on. And then you have some really heavy ones called the baryons. So these are called the mesons. And you have these really heavy ones, the proton, neutron, and so on. These are the really heavy guys. And what is the equivalent to the butterfly? That is our friend, the photon, which has no mass. So that's the particle zoo. And we are trying to try to understand what the properties are. So by the early 1960s, there seem to be at least 30 to 35 elementary particles. Today, there are more than 300 known particles. So it's very difficult to remember all the names. In fact, I don't, and I think even Rajiv, whose memory is phenomenal, I don't think he remembers more than a small fraction of those names. So the very famous quote from Enrico Fermi, you must have all heard of Fermi, Fermi Direct Statistics. So somebody asked him about the, whether he could remember the names of the particles, so he asked, said, and if I could remember the names of all these particles, I would have been a botanist. Because of course, you know botanists have to remember the Latin names of all kinds of uh, different plants. So he, but basically he was expressing his frustration because in physics, you don't try to rely on memory, but you try to rely on an understanding of how to classify and how to understand these particles. In principle, you would like to do that in botany also, but there are so much variety that you have to remember. So the particle world seemed to be similar. Then came a discovery from the late 50s, which was fancifully called the eightfold way. I'll come back to that. But it was discovered that if you take the particles, like the pion and kion, which are called pseudoscalar mesons, you can place the three pions like that. So you measure them by their quantum numbers. So there is a quantum number called isospin, third component. And there's a quantum number called the hypercharge. So we, we, you can measure by, by looking at the different reactions these, these go through. So if you take the pions, then you can place them in this graph like this, based on the quantum numbers. The kions, the k plus and k minus, come opposite, of course. The center, of course, is where all the charge, everything is zero. They come on opposite sides. And there's two other particles called the k0 and the k0, anti k0, which you can place like this. So very symmetric placement. And you can also find another particle called the eta, which sits in the middle. So when you take all these eight particles, you can simply write, draw a hexagon like that and call it the eightfold way. It's called the eightfold way. Why eightfold way? Because Marie Gelman, who invented this or who discovered this, he was a great fan of Buddhism. So you must have read about the Buddha's eightfold way of how to how to uh, free yourself of desire, you know, right thinking and so on. So the Eightfold Way is the name given to uh, this particular thing. Of course, it has nothing to do with Buddhism. Okay, it's just a fanciful name. So here is Marie Gelman on the left, and here is Yuval Neyman on the right side, who actually did make the discovery at the same time. Unfortunately, Neyman's paper never got published. So the Nobel Prize went to Gelman, which I think is a little unfair because they both made the same discovery. Anyway, uh, you, there'll be other examples of that also as we go along. And, and there is your inspiration for Gelman. And if you are more mathematically inclined, then you will realize that all of these eightfold thing actually belongs to something called the representation, eight representation or octet representation of a group called SU3. But that's only for those who want the technical Answer. Now let's look at vector mesons. There's another class of mesons called vector mesons which have spin 1. And there you'll find something interesting. In the same way you can place the rho meson. There are three kinds of them, positive, negative and neutral. 
you can take the excited k or the k star mesons and again put them in the same place. So once again, and you can find the omega, the omega, the neutral omega, and once again you can create exactly the same in full way. Same pattern is being repeated for vector mesons. You can also do it for the baryons. For the baryons, the proton and neutron sit there. There are three sigma particles which sit here. And there are two xi or cascade particles which sit here. And there's also lambda particle which shares the center with the sigma naught. So, same eightfold way exists there too. <laughs> Where have you seen this happen before? Remember, taking our flashback back to the periodic table, the properties of the elements show repetition. And this was used by Mendeleev to predict new elements. So these are the elements which were known in the time of Mendeleev. Okay, so I used to write the periodic table. And remember, Mendeleev used those properties first to predict scanium, then gallium, then germanium, and then after Mendeleev, a whole lot of new particles were found. So, uh, new, new elements were found and they all fit into the periodic table. Now, Niels Bohr in 1922 tried and explained why these properties are repeated. They are repeated because the outer atomic structure, the valence atoms, are arranged in the same way. And you know what this is called? It's called the Aufbau principle. You combine this with the Hund's rule and you are able to distribute electrons and get the atomic structure. So here is an example. Lithium, sodium and potassium have the same behavior. Why is that? Because of this outer electron. This is great. Outer electron here is the 2s1, the 3s1, and the 4s1. It's exactly the same structure. That's why they have the same properties. So the question is, is the same thing happening in the eightfold way? Well, Gelman said, okay, let's suppose it happens. In that case, you can not only put together an 8 of SU3, you can also put together a 10 of SU3, and or a decuplet of SU3. So what he did was that he took the heavy variables and started putting them on this same graph. And what did he find? You could put the deltas on this line. You could put the heavy sigmas on this line, the excited sigmas. You could put the excited size here. How many particles that does that give you? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So in the decuplate, there is one missing. And that one is where? Here unknown particle at the bottom. So exactly like Mendeleev found that there are empty places in the periodic table, similarly Gelman found that there is an empty place in his decuplet. And so he went to light and exactly like Mendeleev, he made a prediction that in that empty place you will find a particle. Go and look for it. And indeed in 1964, which was a few years after Gelman's prediction, they did find a particle called the omega minus, and that omega minus sits perfectly with all the quantum numbers, everything matches and so on, matching with this. So once, remember, the Mendeleev's periodic table was not taken very seriously until people started discovering these elements. So similarly, Gelman's eightfold way was not taken too seriously until people discovered the omega minus. And then people realized that there must be a lot of truth in what he's saying. But Gelman took the idea further. He also took up Bohr's idea, not Gelman alone, but also his wife, George's wife. His picture is in color because he's still with us. Gelman passed away about a year and a half ago. But the idea here was that as with atoms, you're seeing the repetition of properties of hadrons because you're seeing composites of three smaller particles. And when they combine into the same kind of wave, wave function structure, then you begin to see the same properties. So these more elementary particles than the hadrons, which means the mesons and the baryons, they were named quarks by Gelman and aces by Zweig. But somehow the name quarks has survived. So Gelman said there are three kinds of quark, the U, the D, and the S. So the names they go by are U for up, D for down, and S for strange. So strange quark, because in the beginning people didn't understand its behavior, 
And what, you have, what I'm also showing you is the size is a little different. The strange copper squawks are all point particles. But this is proportional to the mass. So the up and down are a little lighter. The strange is a bit heavier. So look at these particles. These are the, there are two mesons here, the pi on and the k0, and two baryons, the proton and the neutron. And what Gelman said is that every meson consists of a quark anti-quark state. So the pi on is a UD bar state. The k on is a DS bar state. The proton is a combination of three quarks. So two U's and a D. And you have to give charge. The U will have charge of plus two thirds. The D and the S will have charge of minus one third. So of course each of these is a so you see this is plus two third and this is minus one third. So the total charge uh, so and it's a bar, so it's an antiparticle, so opposite charge. So plus two third plus two one third and that's one, which is the charge of the pion. D has a charge of one third, S is minus one third, so this is neutral, neutral as in D because it was K is zero. The proton will have two third plus two third, that's four third, and minus one third gives you one, so it's and the neutron has two Ds and a U, so plus two third, minus one third, minus one third, so it's neutral. So that's how you understand that there is these, uh, in some kind of structure where these are bound into the proton, neutron, and so on. So now the eightfold way acquires a different meaning. See, you replace the proton by UUD, replaced by, by UDD, UUS, UDS, DDS, USS, DDS. And you be in a different configuration. <clears throat> so what you are seeing here is that as you go down, the strange component increases. As you go this way, the D component increases. You get more of U's on this side. So if you go from U to D, you go this this way. If you go from U and D to, towards S, comes this way. So naturally, in this corner, you have DSS. That's the maximum you could have got. DSS and DDS. So that's the, so you, see, you can see also see the colors, also the charges for uh, go along this line. This line is positive, this line is neutral, and this line is negative. Okay. Now, if there are quarks, we should be able to pull them out and see them. Just like, you know, when you, have, when you knew that the atom is a bound state of electron and proton, you could pull them out and you could see the proton and neutron, the protons and neutrons and electrons and so on. But we can't do that with quarks. The reason is because of the strength of the interaction between them. So imagine a proton, okay? You have a proton, which is sort of fuzzy because of the wave function. Now, look, think of it as the UD state, U and the D bar quark. Sorry, this is not, did I write proton? No, it's not a proton, it's a rho plus, rho meson. So what I'm trying to do with this is now I'm trying to pull it apart. Let's try to pull it apart. So that means the see this, there is some interaction. So there's a potential. So there's a value for the potential here. So now as we move, try to move it apart, what will happen? You realize that as you try to move it apart, you're putting more work into the system because they attract each other. And when you put that in, of course, you go higher in the potential. And at a point, it is the amount of extra energy you have put into the system is it's enough to create a UU bar pair out of the vacuum. <coughs> so at this level of energy, it's possible to the extra energy you're putting into the system, instead of pulling the quarks further apart, it just creates a quark anti-quark pair. And once you have these quark anti-quark pairs, of course they will form bound states with the earlier ones. And now these bound states will again lie at the bottom of the potential well for this. So essentially now you have a UU bar and a UD bar. UD bar. This is another pi on and this is a neutral pi on. And therefore you have two new mesons. So this is, you know, so separating out quarks will essentially lead you to the production of new quarks and you will get new mesons instead. So it is just like what happens if you try to break a bar magnet into two. You have a north pole and a south pole. You try to break it up in the middle. Then of course a new north pole and south pole there, and you have two small bar magnets. Break it further, you will again get two small bar magnets. And this is actually what happens when you have these interactions of cosmic rays. What happens is you keep producing more and more new quark anti quark pairs out of the energy, and that keeps giving you more and more new particles. 
So this particular process you would refer to as the row going to a pi plus and a pi naught. So quarks cannot be isolated. We say that the quarks are confined. Well, now the force between quarks is not the same as the force between proton and neutron, right? It must be much stronger. So these interactions go by the fanciful name of color interactions. Now see, there are many more charges involved here. So the attraction between quarks is mediated by gluons. And now, corresponding to the SU3, there are three kinds of colors. Okay, of course, each color can go from positive to negative over a wide range of values. But there are three kinds of colors corresponding to an SU3. Okay, for those who understand, SU3 group. And the gluons correspond to the eight of SU3, that is an octet of SU3, so there are eight gluons. And typically, this is your real picture of the inside of a proton or a neutron. There are these large valence quarks, but all the time there are little bits of, you know, there is, there is energy, there is all these, there is this gluonic stuff, and then there are pairs of proton, neutron, or whatever, of, of up quark, down quark, and so on, all the time, which are being produced out of the vacuum, which are going, annihilating and going back into the vacuum. So it's actually a very, very, it's like a bubbling system, dynamic system rather than a static system as earlier people used to think about it. So if you could really take a microscope and go inside a proton, you would see some kind of uh, structure. This of course is an artist impression because no one can actually go inside a proton without disturbing it, but that's a different story. And then if this is the real color interaction, this is the strong interaction, what about the interaction between two protons or two neutrons? Well, you know, between two atoms also you have a force of cohesion, which is known as the van der Waals force. So this is the nuclear force. Remember the one which I calculated is one lakh times the atomic force. That is like the van der Waals force of cohesion between atoms. So now of course you know that the force of cohesion between atoms is far, far less than the force which holds an atom together. So now the strong interaction bears like a van der Waals force. So the actual interaction of gluons, the gluonic interaction is simply mind-bogglingly strong. It's just it's very, very strong. No question. We call it strong interaction, therefore, for obvious reasons. Now, there were also other interesting things found in these decays of these heavy particles. For example, when you look at this uh, decay of a particle called the Xi knot or cascade knot, neutral cascade, it goes to the lambda knot plus pi, but it doesn't go to a neutron plus pi. However, the lambda knot as a man value is about 1300 uh, MeV and this neutron is about 939 MeV. So that means that there is no difficulty, it would have gone to a neutron. Something must be preventing this thing from going to a neutron. So then again, people picked up the same idea which Tuchelberg had given for barrier number and said, okay, there must be a number which is causing this strange behavior. This fellow must be carrying a number, quantum number, which we call plus one. So here are the masses. So you can see that if, it, if this can decay to this, then it can surely decay to this. So now the idea is that these, these two, this fellow must be carrying a quantum number which the lambda carries but the neutron doesn't carry. And this name was called strangeness. So strangeness was first introduced by Gelman and Pais uh, in uh, same Gelman, the younger Gelman as you see here, and Abraham Pais and Nishijima also in Japan. Okay. So these people introduced this quantum subquantum and they called it, for obvious reason, something which causes strange behavior, you call it strangeness. So that was the idea. It repeated the idea of barrier number. Remember the original idea came from Stuckel. So the strange quark, remember we had the strange quark, S quark, it carries strangeness, one. Okay. Now the strange quark has a partner it turns out, which also carries a conserved quantum number, which, well, if you call one thing strange, then you call the other one charm. So this charm, idea of charm, was dis discovered by Glashow, who I will talk more about, Iliopoulos and Mayani. They're all alive, though very old now, all of them. <coughs> Much older, actually, than they look at this picture. But uh, that's why you do color photographs. So these uh, people, they pointed out that there exists something called a conserved number called charm. And therefore, the quark which can, there must be a quark which carries this charm quantum number, C equals plus one, and we obviously, for that reason, call it the charmed quark. Now, 
you could have a bound state of a charmed quark and an anti-charmed quark. The heavy quarks, so it's like positronium. You know, if you, if you look at this uh, graph, the, they look like randomly chasing each other around, but actually if you follow any one of them, you'll see it's going around in the elliptic orbit about the center of mass. Okay, so if you have an electron and a positron bound together, you call it positronium. So similarly, if you have two, a charm and an anti-charm bound to each other, <coughs> you call it a charmonium. So this charmonium was actually discovered in 1974 by two groups, one headed by Burton Richter, who called it the psi particle, and one headed by Sam Ting, who called it the J particle. And this particle, everything matched perfectly with charmonium. So as it happens, one group kept calling it the J and one group kept calling it the psi. So to avoid confusion nowadays, we simply call it the J psi. The J and the psi together, the J psi. And uh, people are happy with this notation. This is probably the only particle which carries two names together. All right. But this was not the end. As I showed you, there was a third generation to come. And let's look at that. So people originally had the neutrino, the electron, electron neutrino, then the muon and the muon neutrino. Correspond to these, there's also the up and down quarks and the charm and strange quarks. And for reasons connected with the having a good quantum field theory, you can put this, these two into families. So when you add up certain quantum numbers of this, it becomes zero and that's needed to prevent the corresponding quantum field theory from picking, having some internal inconsistency. Now, of course, there's nothing to prevent you <coughs> from having more families like this. But why would you do it unless it's needed? So here we come to Kobayashi and Maskawa in 1973. They predicted that there's a phenomenon called CP violation, which for very highly technical reasons, it requires you to have a third generation. So in the third generation, there should be a neutrino, a charged lepton, and two quarks of plus two third and minus one third. So there should be a third generation. So they made this prediction. Years later, they got the Nobel Prize for making this prediction because the particles were actually discovered. The, course, the first to be discovered was this charged lepton, which we today call the tau. It was discovered by Martin Pearl in 1975. He got the Nobel Prize for it. The bottom quark came next. It was discovered in 1977. Then in 1994, in the top quark, it's the biggest and heaviest of them all. And finally, as late as 2001, came the tau neutrino. So this third family is now complete. And then, of course, the same question which Rabi had asked, that the th everything would have been perfect with one family. The second family is demanded by the fact that there's a mu. And now there's a third family which is required because CP is violated. But why do we have, why does CP have to be violated? So why? Why do we have these three families? We don't know the answer to this. And you can ask the question that uh, do we have more families? It seems that from present measurements, you don't have any more. There are only these three families. But if that is so, then you can ask why? What prevents you from having a fourth family and a fifth family and you want, why not have any different number of families? But we don't seem to. We seem to have only three families. There must be a cause for this, but we don't know that cause. Let me go ahead. Okay, it's right there. And let's look at the masses of these fermions. So on this plot, I just put the fermions of the first, second, and third generation and plotted the mass on a scale of GV over on a logarithmic scale. And you see that the neutrinos are very light. Then come these electron neon, but the tau is pretty heavy. So the rise there. So, uh, let me try to fit some light. So, there's a variation of a seven orders of magnitude. The top quark, which is the heaviest, has a, a 172.3 GV, the neutrinos less than 1.8 electron volt. So, GV means the billion electron volts. So, it's a huge variation. Uh, not, not, so, a billion is 10 to the 9. This is actually uh, 1.8 versus 1.7. So it's 10 to the 11. So I don't know why I've written seven orders of magnitude. It's actually uh, 11 orders of magnitude. Should, have, should correct that. Now, if you try to fit a line through these, you see the masses increase from the first to the third generation. The quarks seem to be heavier than the leptons. 
but we don't understand the pattern. If we try to fit a line, there is nothing here. I mean, okay, it does go up. It does go up. It sort of bends, but this one comes down. These are the two sort of this comes down. Little bit. This doesn't come down at all. Maybe there is a pattern in all of this, which one day we will understand. But at the moment, we don't. So this is a good point to stop for breath. This is the first part of my talk is over. I have talked to you about all the particles which make up the standard model. And now in the remaining half an hour, I will tell you about how they interact with each other. So, the, of course, you discussed some interactions already, but let's discuss them now in detail. So, of course, the most fundamental interaction, also the one which was discovered first, is gravitation. So, you know, and gravitation, the first person to try to explain it, understand it was Galileo. He developed the laws of falling bodies. Newton came with his law of gravitation. And then Einstein came with his theory of general relativity, which is Einstein's theory of gravitation. Instantly, I put these golden circles to indicate all those who got Nobel Prizes. Of course, Newton and Galileo lived long before the Nobel Prize. So, but that, it doesn't tell you anything uh, derogatory about them. Then we have the theory of electromagnetism. So electromagnetism we owe to these three people. Again, the basic things. The properties of electricity and magnetism were basically systematically discovered by Gilbert in 1600. Then of course the connection between electricity and magnetism, the all important connection was discovered by Faraday. And finally Maxwell gave us the complete unified theory of electromagnetism. We knew these already. Then. Okay, the strong interactions, I've already explained this to you. So strong interactions, the first to discover, theorize that there are interactions between nucleons was Heisenberg. And then the Maison theory was given by Yukawa and Gelman brought quantum chromodynamics in 1972. He also gave the theory, the SU3 theory of, of color. So that is again due to Gelman and his collaborators. So, we, but there is a fourth interaction, which I have not talked about at all. And that's called the weak interaction. Weak, it is only called the weak nuclear interaction, but we just call it the weak interaction nowadays. So this is the interaction which is responsible for beta decay. And beta decay was first discovered by Rutherford in 1899, when he discovered beta particles. Fermi, I've already introduced you to Fermi for a smart comment he made, but his most smart thing to do was to develop the basic theory of weak interactions in 1934. And then in 1956, Julian Schwinger came up with the idea that these weak interactions must also be due to the exchange of some particles. And of course, he called them weak bosons. So for short, for weak, we just call them W bosons. So similar to the gluons or to the photon, the W bosons intermediate mediate the weak interactions. So we have these four kinds of interactions. Now a little bit about how to relate symmetries to interactions. What do you see here? I'm sure you see a green ball and there's a line in the middle, a red line along a diameter. Now I've said this rotating. Can you see the rotation? Can you see that it's rotating? Well, I'm sure you can't. The reason is that when it rotates, it rotating about the center, so when it rotates and turns around, one part looks just like any other part. Let us say this part, when it rotates here, the appearance of this object doesn't change. It looks exactly the same. So that means that when you look at this, if you write down a theory of this, <coughs> it should not show up and the effect of rotation should not show up at all. However, I have now drawn this out a little bit, huh? increase the diameter. Could you see that it's rotating? Let's do it again. Yes, of course. Clearly it's rotating. You can see that because of the distortion. Now I'm imagining this thing to be an elastic rubber ball, you know, like the ones children play with when you play cricket in your backyard. It's a small rubber ball like this. And of course it's round, so when it rotates you don't see that. But when you pull it out, what happens? You pull it out. Sorry. You pull it out and left it. And what happens is that as you leave it after some time, it comes back and settles into its original spherical shape. So I've already said that. 
But you see that what is happening is that the symmetry comes back. And we call that the elastic force, isn't it? It's a rubber ball which you have pulled out. It comes back. Why? You say, okay, because of the elasticity. The elastic force pulls it back. Now, I could talk entirely in terms of geometry and say that, look, I don't know what elastic force is, but what I can see is that it had this symmetric shape. And when you distorted it from that, it has a tendency to come back to the symmetric shape. So I believe in the geometry. Geomet the geometry should be symmetric. You see, these are completely equivalent statements. Whether I, whether, I, whether, it is, whether I say restoration of the symmetry or whether I say elastic force, these are completely equivalent statements depending on what your, what your way of looking at the world is. <coughs> okay. <coughs> now, this is not my idea. This idea is due to Albert Einstein. His basic famous theory of general relativity basically tells you this. That says that there is a symmetry between all the frames of reference that is, the laws of physics appear the same in all frames of reference. You cannot tell. And therefore, you have to write down your laws of physics in such a way that they will not show up the effect of the frame of reference. So, if you accelerate something, if you change the law of physics, if you do something which violates that, it will come back to whatever was consistent with that. And what brings it back is what is the gravitational force. So, what seems to create an acceleration is really what we are calling is actually the gravitational force. So therefore, that's the principle of equivalence. So we fail say that just like the rubber ball, space-time behaves like an elastic membrane. When you put masses in, they tend to deform it and give rise to a gravitational force, which then tries to make the space-time flat again. So you have this imagine that space-time is like a stretched out rubber sheet where all these lines are drawn on it just to, so you can make out what's happening. Of course, there are no real lines in space-time. And then you put a heavy object in the middle. What happens? The whole thing gets depressed like that. So that's the Earth, let us say. It has depressed it like that. And now you let two things go together. And recently this has been very much in the news. When you have heavy particles distorting space-time like that, if they rotate around each other, then you have waves spreading out this. And these are the gravitational waves. You have been seeing uh, completely uh, different waves spreading out but let's now come to somewhere else. Let's come to quantum mechanics. And Max Born, whose picture you see here, told us that in quantum mechanics, even though the wave function is a complex number, only the modulus, the mod, the mod of the wave function, is physically measurable because it gives us a measure of the probability density, or mod squared gives us the measure of the probability density. But that means that you know, suppose your wave function. You, you keep changing the, image, the the relative imagery and part, right? So it's the argument of the wave function. You keep changing it. What happens? The real part of the wave function becomes a wave, you know, like you used to say. But the length of this wave function is the probability. So you see that when you do anything physical, only the length of the wave function will show up. This angle which it makes with the axis is irre irrelevant. So you should write down your laws of physics in such a way, or quantum mechanics in such a way, that that angle is not going to show up anywhere. Okay, so you cannot measure that phase, it's that, that, or that phase angle, and therefore it's not part of, it's not physics. Just like the, uh, which frame you are in is not physics, similar. So all physical configurations should remain symmetric under the change of phase of the wave function, and therefore, if something begins to show up this phase, the fact that it will come back to a configuration where the symmetry will be there is what we call the electromagnetic force. The corresponding force, either you say there's an electromagnetic phase on, force on particles, or you say there's a tendency for the particles to go back to a configuration where you cannot see the phase. So sometimes this phase is also called a gauge. So therefore, this gauge theory of electromagnetism was first developed basically for gravitation by Hermann Weyl and by London and by Fock in 1927 for electromagnetism. But it's a bit mind-boggling, you know, electromagnetism uh, is a very everyday phenomenon. It's what's helping me to get, get across to all of you. You can see the pictures, you can see, hear me, all because of electromagnetism. And sometimes you see these dramatic effects like lightning in the sky. And if I tell you that, okay, you are seeing all these brilliant things because you can't measure the phase of a wave function. That sounds very esoteric, but unfortunately, that is the way nature is. 
Well, let's come back to the weak interaction. Processes like beta decay require exchange of a charged boson. I told you that Schwinger had come up with that theory in 1956. And so if you have a neutron and a proton, you can imagine this. The neutron decays into a proton, a W and a W. The W then decays to electron and a neutrino. So what is this process? Neutron going to proton, electron, neutron. This is beta decay. So then using the same idea, then such weak exchange bosons must also arise to preserve an underlying gauge symmetry. But remember that this time the particle had a charge. The proton has a charge, the neutron doesn't have a charge. Sorry, the neutron has a charge, the proton has a charge. So this W must be having a charge. <coughs> and W having a charge means that if you have a plug, something with positive charge, there's another particle with negative charge, which is a antiparticle. So that means that there must be more than one charge. And this is, of course, related to the theme of this uh, particular model solve conference. So you see here that these ideas have actually been used, uh, of course, in a slightly different way. Now, Glashow, who was actually Schwinger's PhD student, he was, his PhD problem was to find out a nice proper way to write down this gauge interaction, which could explain the weak bosons. And he went ahead, but he found that the only way you could do this is to combine this theory of weak interaction, exchange bosons, with the electromagnetic theory and have four gauge bosons, not two plus one for photons, but a total of four altogether, the W plus W minus, another one which is neutral called the Z, and the photon. If you do this, you will have a unified theory which works and which is called the electro, electromagnetic and weak, so in short, electroweak theory. So these three, the W plus, W minus and Z, these are what give us weak interactions and the photon, of course, gives us electromagnetics. So this is the new idea due to Glashow. But he could not explain why these forces become separate because the weak interactions are much weaker than electromagnetic. The reason being that these Ws are very, very heavy. Photon is massless. So this he could not explain. He said that's just the way it is. But he couldn't find the explanation. That explanation, in fact, required a lot of thinking. For example, Pauli had discovered as early as 1942, and so rediscovered by C. N. Young in 19, and Mills in 1953, that if you have a gauge bose symmetry, then the gauge bosons should be massless. That means their rest mass should be zero. Of course, they will have a relativistic mass in the moment. And if gauge bosons are massless, the force becomes long range. That means the force is proportional to 1 by r. But if the gauge bosons are massive, the force is short range. I mean, the force goes to, you have, this is what's called a Yukawa potential. The force goes is minus r by lambda. So the exponential falls off very fast. And this lambda wavelength is proportional to 1 by n. So the heavier it is, the smaller, the faster it falls off. So the heavier it is, the smaller is lambda, which means the smaller is the length scale during which the force falls off. So uh, force is very short range if it's mediated by a very heavy particle. And of course, you can then estimate how heavy the particle of the, these interactions will be, and it turns out to be very, very heavy. So then gauge symmetry, we, what did we say about gauge symmetry? It permits only massless particles, massless gauge bosons, but then it permits only long-range interactions. So you can't have a gauge symmetry or weak interactions, because we know that the weak interactions are mediated by particles which are very heavy. So you have a paradox, what's going on? Well, now let's try to understand by going back to this rubber ball. Okay. Now, suppose you took this rubber ball and you put it within, suppose it grew a little bit of a pimple on one side. What would happen? Of course, as it rotated, you would see the pimple rotating. No question. This is rotating. Okay. If the pimple is not there, no, you can't see the rotation. But the moment the pimple grows, you will see it rotating. So a mass for a gauge boson is like that pimple. As soon as it grows, you have broken it. So just like you have this projection here, you broke the rotation symmetry of the elastic sphere, a mass term would break the gauge symmetry, corresponding gauge symmetry of the universe. And you would be able to see the effect of that gauge symmetry breaking. The rotation effects would be seen. So what does that mean? That if 
in a rubber ball you have an elastic force if you push up something like this the elastic force will just pull it back it will cause it to disappear similarly the gauge force will cause the mass terms to vanish so even if you didn't give a mass to something the gauge force will cause it to disappear and for all the particles should be massless but we just said that no they are massive okay so we have a paradoxical situation either we have one or the other we can't have both so what's going on so this was a big puzzle in the around 1960 and the solution was found in the same year by two gentlemen who I'll show you but let's go back to the rubber ball suppose you put the rubber ball in the fumes of liquid nitrogen what would happen after some time the rubber would freeze so the cooling would cause the rubber to undergo a phase transition so now it's a frozen piece of rubber similarly as the universe cooled after the big bang it also underwent a phase transition we'll do this in parallel so what happens now that if you pull up something an extrusion from here now the elastic force is gone this is frozen rubber so this thing will stay and if you now move this around you will be able to see it so similarly exactly in the same way as universe cooled the phase transition happened the original gauge symmetry disappeared and you began to see massive gauge bosons so this idea was first proposed by two gentlemen Nambu and Jonah Lassinio in 1960 they also won the Nobel Prize for at least Nambu won the Nobel Prize for it and uh, this idea of course has now become very popular across many many branches of physics so now you may ask that what was it that underwent this phase transition I mean, just like in the, for the ball, it was a ball of rubber. But what is the equivalent of that rubber? So that answer came from many gentlemen. First, there were Anglais and Braut. Within a month of them came Peter Higgs. And then in a the couple of months, also came Guralnik, Hegel, and Kibble. And all these gentlemen came up with essentially the same idea, that there must be a spinless field pervading the universe which underwent this phase transition. So as the universe cooled, a phase transition happened in this field. And this field broke the electric symmetry and acquired a mass. And remember this acquired it happened at a very high temperature. High temperature of a million, million, well, uh, million, billion Kelvin. So very, very high. This is called the electric transition temperature. Unimaginably high so far as we are concerned, but still cooler than the Big Bang. So this thing happened. What happened when this happened? Now, Peter Higgs was the one who came up with the idea that, look, if this did happen, then there is a way you can prove it. You'll be able to find a massive spin zero boson, which can be detected to its electroweak interactions. Okay, if it breaks the electroweak symmetry, it must have electroweak interactions. So Higgs said, go ahead and look for this. And indeed, people did look for it. It is called the Higgs boson. And the search, unfortunately, went on for 48 years. So in the beginning, people had no clue about where to look, what the mass of the Higgs boson could be. So it could be anything from about a GV when it was proposed to about 800 GV. It can't be heavier than that for some technical reasons, but it has to be somewhere in between. And then year by year, this range began to shrink as people kept looking. And eventually it kept shrinking till it was actually discovered at 125 GV, at which point, of course, there's no range. You know the exact mass. And the machine which helped us to do it was called the Large Hadron Collider. It is at CERN in Geneva. You see a cutaway cross section. This is this huge pipe tunnel where protons collide with each other. This is a superconducting tunnel, so there's superconducting fluid inside, which stays inside this. This huge pipe goes around the, the entire diameter is 27 kilometers so that's why there is this space here because you can actually take a scooter and ride around if you have to make uh, repairs so this vast instrument was built and the, what one of the things it immediately did was to find out the Higgs person I'm showing you a picture of the uh, meeting at CERN where this was announced and this gentleman here in the, with the white hair raising his arm is the director general of CERN and I remember he raised his hand and said, gentlemen, I think we have it. So it was found after 48 years. And somewhere in this audience, here in this audience, just behind his arm, you see an old man clapping. And this happens to be Peter Higgs himself. And of course, the year after that came the Nobel Prize 
But uh, before that, I'll take you a little bit back to the 1960s, to these two gentlemen called Weinberg and Salam. And they also show, had showed that it's not only the Higgs boson, but all the fermions, the quarks and the leptons, they also acquired their mass through the Higgs boson phase transition. In fact, when the, these particles interact with the Higgs, then you get a stronger mass. You know how this is? You must have, I'll actually come back to this. You must have heard, read the story of Vikram or Vital. So remember the Vital was on Vikram's back. So you can imagine that these uh, fermions, the quarks and leptons, they are carrying Higgs bosons on their backs. And the stronger the interaction with the Higgs boson, then the more of Higgs bosons, it's not one beta, but you know, a whole lot of beta, more and more Higgs bosons come and sit on your back because your interaction with them, you're, you're attracting them more. So if you, have, if you have no interaction with the Higgs boson, fine, you have no mass. You go through at the speed of light, like the photons and the gluons are massless. But as you get, attract the Higgs more and more, the more stronger your attraction is, more and more Higgs will come and sit on your back as you propagate and will make you slow. So, <coughs> okay, I'll come back to this. So, but, and the proof of that is that people have actually shown that the strength of the interaction which you measure on this axis and the mass of the particle are just proportional to each other. All these particles come on a straight line. And that proportionality shows that this idea is basically correct. So we now have a proof of that also. One more thing happens is that, which I have not, I have sort of talked about briefly, is to try to understand the color interaction. So now every quark carries three possible quantum numbers, which we call color, but it's just because there are three of them. You know, it's like you have red, blue, and green for colors, similarly, but they are not real colors. So the mixing up of these quantum states does not change the physical state. So you have symmetry under color transformations. And to preserve the symmetry, once again, you have to have gauge bosons, which are called the gluons. So this gauge theory of color is called, it's, a, it's again a gauge theory. It is again developed by Gelman together with Fritsch and Lloyd Wheeler, who are still alive, who were students then in 1972. Okay, so now when we put all of these together, we have six quarks and six leptons, three weak bosons, one photon, eight gluons. We know what they all do. And one Higgs boson. This is the first slide I showed you. There's the electroweak gauge interaction, the color gauge interaction, the Higgs self interaction, because that's what makes the Higgs particle stick. Higgs fermion interaction, which gives mass to the fermions. And there's, of course, gravitation. We don't know if gravitation is mediated by a particle by the graviton. It's very likely because they are gravitational waves. So when you quantize those gravitational waves, you should get gravitons, but we don't have evidence yet. So there are two other effects which I have not talked about, which are called parity violation and CP violation, which are effects of the weak interaction, which I can tell you later if you want to ask, but uh, let, let's skip them for the moment. So all of this together forms what we call the standard model of particle physics, a certain bunch of particles and a certain kind of interactions between them. Some of you may be able to recognize this house. Okay, this is the house which belongs to the richest man in India. It's also one of the ugliest houses in India. You see, this is the Bombay skyline. And you see here this house, which sort of looks like, you know, three, four different houses piled on top of each other without any relation to the one below. Okay, this is one kind of modern architecture, but to me at least, it looks like different houses were just pile one on top of each other. Unfortunately, the standard model is a bit like that. It's very successful. Of course, the man who built that house is also very successful, but it's not pretty. So, I'll show you, these are some of the, let me just give these, these are some of the examples of the success of the standard model, but let me just write it. There are literally hundreds of tests which the standard model has passed successfully. And there's no reason to think that it is not the correct description of fundamental particles and their interactions at energies up to about a TV, which means a tera electron volt or a uh, billion electron volts. Uh, no, not a billion, but a thousand billion electron volts. Million, million. Which is as far as current experiments go. So then, can we say that we have a complete theory of fundamental particles and their interactions? No, we can't draw the curtain yet. 
And the reason why we can't draw the curtain yet is that there are unanswered questions. So again, I'll take you on a flashback to something which was said <coughs> by Robert Millikan. You heard of Millikan's uh, oil drop experiment. <coughs> in 1894, he said, it seems probable that most of the grand underlying principles have been firmly established, that further advances has to be sought, whatever, only rigorous application. And he there says, an eminent physicist, which was actually himself, remarked that the future truths of physical science are to be looked for in the sixth place of this. So nothing to do. You basically, we understand everything. 1894, after that came relativity, quantum mechanics, all these particles I talked about, everything came after that. As late as 1993, so really 100 years after that, Stephen Hawking, okay, this is a picture of Hawking when he was young and, and fit. He said, although we have not found the exact form of all the physical laws, we already know enough to determine what happens in all but the most extreme situations. So you see that 100 years later, we have completely new theories, but he is as confident as before. And he added that he gave it a 50-50 chance that we will find the exact laws in the next 20 years. Well, it's been 27 years and we are no better off than we were before. But why are we saying all this? One of the principal reasons is, I mentioned something called the dark matter puzzle. So today we believe that, you see, these are all distant galaxies. And every galaxy, we believe that there's a sort of fuzzy uh, thing surrounding it, which we call dark matter. Of course, you don't see dark matter. So this is an artist's view. What you really see is something like this. You see these bright galaxies, but the dark matter is there. And we can see it through other means by using things like gravitational lensing and so on. Most galaxies seem to be immersed in a halo of dark interaction and matter, which has only gravitational interactions and maybe weak interactions. We don't have the proof, but maybe. So you think of a, a galaxy like this. This is the interior of the galaxy, and then there's a halo of dark matter around it. Now the standard model has no particles which can explain dark matter. So therefore, we are trying to look for new particles, which could be the dark matter. So typically, the idea would be that you make a big detector, you put some material inside, like heavy water or something, you put all these photo tubes inside, and the incoming particle will come, hit some particle inside, and go out. But there will be some energy release, which your photomultiplier case will pick up. So these are the dark matter cell experiments. Unfortunately, they've been going on for maybe some 20, 30 years. No success so far. We haven't found any particles. So that's one big question. The second question has to do with dark energy. So remember, we, have, we all know about the Big Bang. After the Big Bang, the universe exploded as a huge fireball, very high temperatures. Then at some stage, that fireball cooled down and structures started forming. And then eventually it, it, it cooled down and to galaxies and stars and so on. And that's the universe which we see today at a temperature as low as 2.7 Kelvin. Now, the point is that there is a rate at which it expands. So there is a parameter R today which is 46.5 into billion light years. So there is this thing and then as you see that this uh, R changes with time but it changes linearly with itself, with the logarithmic growth. So this law is called Hubble's law. The rate of change of R is proportional to R, or the velocity by which R changes is proportional to that this R itself. And this H is called Hubble's constant. Now, unfortunately, measurements of Hubble's constant show that this law is not really perfect. I mean, this blue line would be the straight line you expect from that law. But actually, when you go to high, high distances or high velocities, you see that they are actually the galaxies are moving a little faster than you thought. So therefore, there is actually accelerating. So DRDT is not HR, but it's actually greater than HR. And this was discovered by Rice, Perlmutter and Schmidt in 1998. Of course, they look a bit older nowadays, but they're all, all with us. So this discovery shows that the universe is not just expanding level, it's actually accelerating. Now, in order to accelerate, after the Big Bang, there must be some force which is pushing it apart. So gravity, of course, will pull it back. Gravity is an attractive force. So there must be some repulsive force 
which is too weak to be seen in the laboratory, but which seems to work at large distances. And that is what we call dark energy. Some matter with mutual repulsion, which is the other name for that is dark energy. Again, the standard model has no particles which can explain dark energy. So, second big question. Third big question is what we call the antimatter puzzle. Why is that? In the aftermath of the Big Bang, radiation converted to matter, again, equal to mc squared. So, some of the radiation energy started converting to particles with mass m. But when this happened, the standard model interactions through which these conversions happen, strong interaction, weak interaction, they largely don't distinguish between particles and antiparticles. So, you should have seen as many particles as antiparticles. But the universe is composed only of matter, otherwise, we would be annihilating with antimatter all the time. So, the antimatter must have annihilated out a long time back. That means there's a, there must have been more matter than antimatter. So, why does that happen? And the answer is given by Sakharov in 1967. And he pointed out that weak interactions have a small anti particle antimatter symmetry, asymmetry, which is called CP violation. I mentioned it before in the context of Kobayashi Maskawa. But now Sakharov pointed out in 67 that the real reason why we do it exist as matter is because of this CP violation. And of course, that CP violation can be accommodated. The standard model if there are three generations, I've already told you this. This idea was brilliantly confirmed by the Bebar and Bell experiments between 19. So therefore, the error came down to about one part in a lakh. Okay. So because that's the level of CP violation. There's about one part in a lakh of CP violation. And these experiments are fantastic. I can tell you that you look at the head of this, there's a little bit of a circle here. That's the uncertainty knowing where the head of this triangle lies. But when I began to do my PhD, then this triangle could have, head could have sit, sat anywhere inside this blue circle. And so over the years, the accuracy of experiments has increased so that it is that entire blue circle has come down to this little point. So we've done a lot of good experiments, but nevertheless, the problem is that the uh, level of uh, CP violation, level of asymmetry is only about one in a lakh. But that's no, not even one in a lakh, sorry, one in a hundred lakh because this is a percentage. But to explain the observed matter antimatter symmetry, you must have hundred percent because all the antimatter is gone and you have all the matter. So this must have been much more. Well, at least substantially much more greater than this. Otherwise, there would be very little matter. So what's going on? We don't know the answer to this. And that's another big question. <coughs> then there is something called the mass hierarchy problem. So let's try to understand this. A free Higgs boson would travel like, if it had no interactions, it would travel like a classical free particle. I'm just making it coming and go but as in a straight line with a constant speed. But because it is interaction with other particles, it can use its energy to pull particle and antiparticle pairs out to the vacuum. And effectively, it's like it increases its mass. So the Higgs as it goes in, uh, as it propagates, will be pulling more and more particle and antiparticle pairs out of the vacuum and this mass will keep on increasing. So the Higgs becomes heavier and heavier. And of course, this happens in a fraction of a second. So after some time, the Higgs becomes very, very heavy. It goes on becoming heavy. How when does it stop? When it's as heavy as you or me? No. It will stop when the Higgs boson has become as heavy as the heaviest particles in the theory. Because after that, getting new particles won't make it too, too much heavier. And this happens when the gravitational interactions become as strong as the electromagnetic interactions at a mass called the Planck mass. But the Planck mass is 1.9 into 10 to 19 GV and the Higgs mass is only 125 GV. So something is preventing the Higgs from going from 125 GV to this huge value. So something is holding it back, not letting it go to this huge value. So if that is happening, that is my bigger. What is, what is doing that? That's called the mass hierarchy problem. That's another question. Finally, there is the issue of something called the vacuum stability problem, which I'll explain to you like this. The potential energy due to the Higgs boson, it changes shape as the energy increases. Suppose you're plotting energy on this side, and for the current energy level, which we know the energies which we have in the laboratory, this is the shape of the Higgs potential. 
So as you see, there's a little bit of a peak at zero value of the Higgs, and then as the Higgs value, Higgs mass exponential increases, you go to let us say either this or this, one of these zeros. Okay, the minimum. And that's where the universe is lying today. But if you increase the energy, this changes shape and becomes a little deeper. So then the universe would gradually slip down here. Change the energy a little more, it goes down deeper. Change it more, because we know the form of the exponential. So now it goes down much deeper and eventually, at some energy, this is flipping completely. So it's becoming like an inverted parabola. But what does that mean? If the universe, see you're plotting energy on this side, on this axis, the y-axis. So if the universe goes down to minus infinity of energy, then infinite amount of energy will be emitted. Why isn't that happening? The universe is very cold, only 2.7 Kelvin. Where is all that energy? So that is telling you that this thing cannot happen. This vacuum turning around will not be able to happen. Okay, so this catastrophe will not happen. So that means that something is happening to prevent this this potential from flipping like this. What is doing that? That again is a question. So these are questions which are not answered in the standard model and for which you need to go beyond the standard model. And of course, for a long time, people have been putting in a lot of thought into this. This is, of course, a picture of Rodos Thinker. And scientists have been thinking about it. Theorists have put in a lot of thoughts. And uh, it's not that they have not come up with ideas. Okay. Here is a slide which I have stolen from somebody else, from a blog called Quantum Diaries, which shows you sort of the different kinds, you know, the area where people have thought of many kinds of ideas. So as you see. Uh, what, uh, whatever, super, what is this, super, queer uh, case, spontaneous CP violation, heavy Majorana fermions, MSSM, whatever, okay, super, uh, what is that, Reefer, uh, technicolor, technicolor interactions, and all kinds of things. Many, many ideas have been thought of, and of course, there are large things which have not been thought of yet, of course, otherwise, uh, there would be nothing more to think. So perhaps one of these will be the right idea. We don't know. We, are, we will have to look to the future for this. And it's entirely possible that all of which, uh, which we understand. Remember, uh, there are these huge questions about the cosmos which we don't understand. So it's good to end on a note of humility with the words of the great man himself. Remember what he said? I do not know how I appear to the world, but to myself I seem to have been only like a boy playing by the seashore and diverting myself and now and then finding a smoother pebble or a prettier shell than ordinary, whilst the great ocean of truth lay all undiscovered before me. It's possible that the standard model, which I've talked about, all the discoveries we have made, are just one of those, is just that smooth pebble or a pretty shell, and there is a lot of truth to be undiscovered. Maybe some of you younger people will be the people who will show the path to discover those. We do not know. We certainly, there's a lot of exciting things to which will happen in the future. So on that note, let me finish this talk. And let me thank you, all of you, for your attention in listening to this talk. I hope you found something interesting and something to inspire you for the future of this talk. Okay. Thank you. I'll now stop sharing and I'll be happy to take this. Thank you, Professor Raichaudhary, for the amazing talk. So, I guess we can uh, start with the questions now. First, we'll start with the offline questions from the audience in the auditorium. So, if anyone has any questions, uh, kindly raise your hands. Uh, the volunteers can ask you to come to any one of the mics to ask your questions. Due to COVID protocols, we can't pass the mic right now. So. Also, for those who are attending it online, and if you have any questions, then feel free to uh, post your questions in the chat box to the host. Uh, or else, what you can, if you are fine with unmuting yourself and asking your questions, just type the word question in the chat box to the host. We will ask you to unmute yourselves turn by turn, and then you can ask your question to the speaker. Yeah, back to the auditorium. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, uh, those who are asking questions, kindly introduce yourself. Hello. Hello. So can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah, 
हेलो आई एम सुब्रमण्यम फ्रॉम फर्स्ट ईयर आर पी एस सी फिजिक्स आई हैव इन ट्रेड एनीथिंग अबाउट ऑल दिस स्टफ बट वन थिंग इज इंटरव्यूंग इज दैट यू सेट फॉर डार्क डार्क मैटर यू आर परफॉर्मिंग सम एक अनोन then it won't be dark after that right it will be something we are creating something it never it won't be a dark after that well let's not let's not worry too much about the meaning of the word in english in physics dark matter means something which doesn't emit electromagnetic radiation okay so the dark matter particle suppose i mean we believe that we are immersed in dark matter so there is dark matter you know in your room in your auditorium as around you there is dark matter in my room as we go around it's it's going around us all the time okay it has weak interaction so most of the time it simply passes through us now if something remember dark doesn't mean unknown dark means it doesn't emit electromagnetic radiation it doesn't participate in the electromagnetic interaction so when a dark matter particle suppose there is a dark matter particle it goes through that detector material it in, it can interact with one of the nuclei through the weak interaction it doesn't have strong interactions we know that but the weak interaction is possible so if it interacts with the nucleus you know just like you have beta decay you could have a beta or an inverse beta decay that nucleus could then emit a particle which is seen that is the idea. you're seeing it indirectly the dark matter particle itself you cannot detect you can only detect it indirectly but of course we know this already because neutrinos are detected like that a neutrino doesn't leave a track a neutrino doesn't leave a signal you have to detect it by its interaction with other things and infer its existence so that is the way you would like to detect dark matter but if it's you know you look at it and when the inference points clearly that it was one of these unknown particles which came and did it you would then call it a dark matter particle okay Yes, sir. It's I not dark it. matter in the sense. It's not dark in the sense that you will never know it. I mean, then there's no point in doing it. Yeah, that's what. Okay, I understood, sir. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, if there are any other questions from the auditorium. Ah. Uh, yeah. Sir. Kindly keep your masks on while asking. Uh, hi professor thank you for the illustrious talk i am tanmay i'd like to ask you uh, if you could uh, please share some light on what the current approaches are to solve the neutrino mass problem well it's a whole industry in itself but i'll tell you one basic so let me first tell you what the neutrino mass problem is the neutrino mass problem is that we know now that neutrinos do have mass what we don't understand is why the mass is so small okay even compared to the electron which has a mass of 511 kilo electron volts the neutrino mass is about an electron volt so why it is so many thousands of times smaller than uh, the other particles we don't understand okay we don't now of course we have theories so the one of the best ideas which has been proposed is that really there are not just the neutrino species we see but there is one more neutrino which is very heavy and then there is a mixing phenomena which takes place between these which you know the result of that mixing is to make so originally the neutrino now these two neutrinos one was reasonably heavy sort of same mass let us say as the electrons and other particles and the other one was reasonably heavy not too heavy not too light but the mixing happened in such a way as to drive one neutrino mass to this very low value of electron volt and to make the other one very heavy this mechanism is called a seesaw you know you been you been on a seesaw what happens the seesaw is at a level then one goes side goes down one side goes up so one becomes very heavy one becomes very light something like that so this is known as the seesaw mechanism so if the seesaw mechanism is, is correct then you would have one neutrino which is very light which is the one you see Okay, or three neutrons which are very light, and corresponding there will be some neutrons which is very heavy. 
So you have not detected it because you don't have the energy to detect it yet in any experiment. Now, if such a thing is true, then of course you'll be able to prove it only by looking for that heavy neutrino. So one day if you find that, we'll be able to understand it. So this is one of the many ideas. It's probably the most popular idea to understand the neutrino mass. Okay. But people have come up with all sorts of exotic ideas, which then I would, it would take me the whole evening to tell you about. Yeah, so uh, there was one more question. Hello, Professor. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Good evening, Professor. Uh, that talk was really great. Uh, I have a, a simple question like uh, there is a doubt that is in my mind for a long time. What do you really mean by virtual photon and how they are different from usual photon? And if it is virtual, why it is there uh, at all? That's not a simple question at all. That's actually a very technical question. And I don't think I can answer it without going into technicality. But I can tell you the difference. A real photon, of course, is a photon whose mass, which is massless. A virtual photon has a very... And a real photon is also stable. Because a photon will if you keep, keep reflecting in between, for example, if it's not absorbed anyway, it will go on forever, reflecting between reflecting points. But a virtual photon is a very small lifetime and a virtual photon also has a mass. Okay, so it's like the photon in many ways, but it doesn't obey the same relativistic kinematics as a photon. Okay. So will it be electromagnetic? Uh, it's electromagnetic interaction. It's every, everything is the same as a photon. It's, it, it, wave. it's basically it's electromagnetic wave. It's basically a device to understand a quantum field. So, so being an electromagnetic wave, how can it have any mass? As I said, it's a device to understand the process in quantum field. Okay, so I could simply say that there is no, okay. It's, this is just a process which happens in the field theory and give you the initial and final states, and that would be the correct way to do it. But if you want to imagine a model by which it works, it is as if a photon was exchanged. All these exchanges are talking is as if there was an exchange. Okay, in quantum mechanics, you have only initial and final states. What happens in between, we do not know. Okay. So, field, quantum field theory is the quantum mechanics of a field, right? So, in that theory, basically, if you try to want to understand the exact mechanism, we don't know, just like we don't know any mechanism in quantum mechanics. This is a model, it's what you call a semi-classical model, which enables you to understand, some have some idea, okay? Now, if you try to prove it further, of course, there is no answer, all right? It's like trying to understand what is exactly how does an electron move inside an atom. We don't know. Is there in some regions, more likely to be in some regions, less likely to be in some other regions, okay? These are, there are some questions which a quantum theory doesn't allow you to ask. This is one. Right, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, are there any other questions from the auditorium? Okay, so I guess we can move on to the questions from the Zoom chat. And uh, there is one of our volunteers is keeping an eye on the YouTube questions. If there are any, we will answer it at the end. Okay. Yeah. So uh, there is a question by Gaurav. So Gaurav is asking, what does forbidden actually mean in proton to pions decay? Is it some kind of repellent force? No. Something is forbidden for it. See, let, let me ask you a question. If you are forbidden, to sit in the seat next to somebody else, as you are now because of COVID regulation. You are forbidden to sit there, right? Is it because you have a repellent force from that person? No. There is some rule, some law which you are obeying, which is preventing you from doing that. So similarly, the law which is preventing the proton to pion decay is the law that some particular quantity has to be conserved. That quantity is called the barrier number. So in, in decaying to a proton, it will violate that. For example, let's ask a simple question. Suppose you are, why doesn't the proton decay into three electrons? It's allowed by the mass. What what will be preventing it from doing that? Well, the proton has positive charge, electron final initial state will have charge plus one, final state will have charge minus three. But you know that electric charge is conserved. So conservation of electric charge is what prevents this decay from happening. It's not a repelling force. Okay. So similarly, Conservation of baryon number is what prevents the proton from decaying to pions. Okay. It's a conservation law, not a repelling force. 
<laughs> thank you for the answer sir so uh, there is a question by vedant so vedant is asking is there any explanation for conservation of quantum numbers like baryon number strangeness etc okay very good question and a very deep question remember i talked to you about symmetries i told you there are certain symmetries which prevent you from seeing some now there is a beautiful mathematical theorem by a lady mathematician called Amy Noether, which tells you that whenever there is some kind of symmetry like that, there is always a conserved quantum number. And there are examples which we know from uh, ordinary mechanics also. The fact, for example, that you cannot tell uh, the, you can make a translation, there is no, there is no fixed point in space. You can make a translation in space and nothing will change. You can move the origin of your frame of reference. So that is it's called translate, uh, uh, symmetry under space translation. You can show that the corresponding conserved quantum number is the linear moment. Similarly, you, you, you can show that the space time is isotropic. So rotations in any direction will give you the same size. The result is conservation of angular moment. Similarly, there is a symmetry corresponding to every conserved quantum number. For electromagnetism, that the conservation of charge is due to the gauge symmetry. Similarly, for all the others. Okay. So, there is an explanation for conservation of quantum numbers, numbers which is always a particular symmetry. <coughs> now, if you ask that is an explanation for the symmetry, no. That's the way nature is. So, uh, I guess Vedant's question is answered. Uh, so, uh, Abhinav, I, I guess uh, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, Abhinav, I guess the, you now have the permission to unmute yourself. Am I audible? Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, good evening, sir. <laughs> sir, I am Ayush. Actually, uh, it's my brother's account. So, sir, uh, sir, uh, sir, I wanted to ask, sir, I, uh, uh, when I read about the Higgs boson particle, the Higgs boson collider, sir, there was a statement that uh, it is uh, the co collision is like when you fire two bullets uh, across a country and expect them to meet at some point. So, uh, is that statement true? And yeah. sir, uh, like, uh, if if it is true, sir, sir, then what are the basis? Like, what are the traces that we find that we expect uh, that is a Higgs boson collide or uh, particle? Or maybe how do we find that? Like, uh, I'm a first year student from engineering, so sir, that's, very curious to know about okay. that. That's okay, but the, see, something should be answerable just by just by logic. What what it means by see, if you take two bullets and fire it across the country. How would you ensure that they would actually would have collisions? Let me ask you that question. Is it okay for you and your friend to stand and just to fire two bullets and let and expect them to collide? Yes, sir. That was like it is very difficult to to ensure. Very difficult, that. right? The chance of that happening is very small. Okay, and if you fire one bullet, it won't happen. If you fire ten bullets, it won't happen. But if you keep firing. Suppose you fire a million bullets, then surely one of them will, and both of you keep firing bullet. Maybe one of few, few of them will collide, isn't it? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Understand, sir. So that's what the LHC does. It takes millions and millions of protons and just throws them at each other, and a few of them collide. Most of them don't collide. They just pass through each other. Fine, you throw them away. And protons are cheap. Okay, they're just hiding them. So <coughs> you take out the protons put them back in atoms, you've got hydrogen again, sir. <coughs> but once in a while, they do collide. When they collide, they produce various different things, and a small fraction of those are Higgs bosons. Now, Higgs boson doesn't live long. It almost immediately decays. Okay? So, I didn't want to tell you that. Go to the technical. It decays into other particles, but when it decays into other particles, the signature of those particles having come from a Higgs boson is there. In particular, it's there in the fact that if you look at their momenta and you add them up, then you can calculate the mass of the Higgs boson. So, if you have a whole bunch of particles, all of which seem to come from the decay of a particular particle with a particular mass, 
then that must be, and that's not not any of the known masses. It must be from a new particle. Okay. Then you look at other things like the angular distribution and so on, and that has all given all the information we have about things. So it is indirect evidence. The evidence we have about the W and the Z, and the top cock, all of this is in it. These are all particles which decay within a fraction, a very small fraction of a second. Okay, such that you can you can never see a track from them ever. Okay, the track will always be of the let us say size of a few few nuclear sizes. So you will never be able to see them. You see them all through their other decays and through indirect evidence. But that indirect evidence is pretty solid. I mean, until it is pretty solid, we would not say we have this out. Okay, so that's how we do it. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir. So the next question is: How strange matter converts other matter like itself? I'm sorry. Like I guess he has made some mistake in the question. Okay, so it reads: How strange matter convert other matter like itself in core of neutron neutron stars? Well, actually, the person who knows really well about it is sitting in your audience. I think now he's sitting almost alone. That is Rajiv. Professor Rajiv Gavai is an expert on this. But basically, you use the phenomenon called flavor conversion, which happens, and um, in that high and highly, let's say, highly uh, strong environment of a uh, lot of particles crushed together, a lot of, uh, then you, you don't really have uh, separate neutrons and protons. All the quarks and everything is crushed together into something which we think is a quark called a coagulant plasma, and there you can have this conversion. Okay, but I'm not an expert on this, and I'm not even daring to open my mouth in front of one of the world's top experts. So <laughs> I, won't, I won't say anymore. If you want to know more? Please ask Professor Gavai. Yeah. yeah, sure, sir. Professor, if you would like to share anything now. Yeah, yeah, sure. We will continue with the questions first. So, so uh, Shashwat, you, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Good evening, sir. Sir, I am Shashwat and uh, I had a question that uh, you told about the rubber ball and yes. uh, you you talked about the elastic force yes. and uh, while you explained about the wave functions, you told about the restoration of symmetry and uh, electromagnetic force. Yes. So, can we say that the elastic force which you told is some kind of an electromagnetic force? No, 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 don't take that literally. It's only an analog. It's only an analogy by saying you know, that you could interpret the force, the action of the force, as restoring a symmetry. Okay? That the force prevents you from doing something. Okay? The force prevents you from distorting the ball. I mean, the nature of that force is irrelevant here. Okay? The force prevents you from distorting the ball. Similarly, the force prevents you from measuring the phase of the wave function. It prevents you from doing something. The force in gravitational force prevents you from seeing the uh, which frame you are in. Okay, it gives you the same wave and all frame. So that's the idea. So the fact that I used the rubber ball, I could have used some other thing. So it's just the analog. The idea is not, don't worry about what the actual interaction in the rubber ball is. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, thank you for the question and thank you for the answer, sir. Uh, I guess we can take a couple of more questions and due to the time constant, I guess we'll have to stop. Uh, so, there is a question by Jyoti Raditya. Uh, so, it's a long question. So, yes, I read the question. He's asking basically that uh, do we have any expectations of where the dark matter particle is or what the probability will be? Unfortunately, it's not so well defined as for the Higgs particle. The expectation depends pretty much on what idea, what model you have for dark matter. Unfortunately, dark, we know so little about dark matter except that it exists, that you can almost write down any model you like. So, of course, it has to be, you know, there's a certain range we can look for. And we do that, you know. There are, people have pointed out that if it is lighter than something, we will not be able to see it. If it is heavier than something, we will not be able to see it. But anyway, at least we search for what we can. You know, it is like that story that I have lost my keys on the road. But I can't look for it because most of the road is dark. So at least let me look under the lamppost where there is light. If I'm lucky, I will find it there. If it's not there, then bad luck, I won't find it. But at least let me try. So that's what we are doing for dark matter. We don't have that kind of... And for the Higgs, we had a much clearer, clearer thing. 
So thank you, sir. I guess we can take one last question from the Zoom chat. Uh, it's by Pratham. So he is asking, what's the analogy which we gave for the attraction, like we gave for repulsion, that the two ice skaters are passing the ball. Well, you saw that the ice skater, the guy came close to give it to him because he wanted it to go into his hands. So that was the attraction. <laughs> so don't take these things too literally. Don't take just don't take them too literally. So long as you understand what is happening, it's okay. Yeah. So I guess we can take one last question from the auditorium itself. Uh, and then I guess we can stop. There seems to be one more question, uh, which is actually a couple of questions. Uh, yeah, there are a couple of more questions. Like, oh. okay, I think there's one nice question which I'd like to take. So, Jyotiraditya yeah. has asked, we have been able to break charge parity and time symmetries individually, but not charge parity time symmetry of the universe. Can we ever expect to break that? I would love to see that we have broken it in some small way, but at the moment we don't. Okay, I can't tell you the answer. I would have to be an astrologer to find out how to find that. But uh, yes, if it is final, it will certainly be be interesting. And then uh, initially the possibility which happened. Okay, let's not go into that. Uh, then any other. So there's a question from Devan who has a small question. So let's take that and let's call that the last question. Yeah, sure. Uh, Devang, you can unmute and ask your question. Hello, sir. Can you hear me? Yes. So uh, actually, I just wanted to ask, uh, is there any research happening around the world theoretically or uh, experimentally to find new fundamental particles other than graviton? Oh, yes. There's a great deal of it happening. The entire LHC, for example, is running with two collaborations, each of which has some three to four thousand people in it. And apart from that, I think there are several thousand people across the world who are all trying to research and look for new particles. There are many, many, many. There's a huge amount of research going on. Okay. Well, in my small way, I'm doing a little bit. But there's, at least even in India, there are more than about 200 people doing it. And if you go across the world, you find many, many. Yes, very active and exciting. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I guess we can take the last question from the auditorium. Okay. Hello, sir. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you, sir, for a great talk. Uh, my name is Rishikesh, and I have two questions. So, one is related to vacuum instability. So, so you mentioned that uh, the universe could be in some sort of a metastable state, right? And there could be an even more stable uh, vacuum. So, in that case, uh, would the universe be able to like tunnel into that more stable vacuum? And would this uh, tunneling be observable? As in, would life cease to exist if something like that happens? Uh, that is my first question. Right. Let's answer this first, then you come to your second question. The first thing is that we don't know whether it's in a metastable state, okay? Because uh, if, the, if, if there is new physics, it could very well be a stable state. Now, if the universe does go to a different state, of course, the universe has to evolve. So, it will go slowly, so you will keep it. If there is another state, which is much lower in energy, and we are sitting in some metastable state, then the tunneling should be able to happen, okay? Of course, the tunneling probability, there will be a tunneling time. And that time has to be greater than the life of the universe, right? Otherwise, which is some 14, what is, what, 14 million years. Otherwise, we wouldn't go there. The chances of our going there. And when you turn into something with much lower energy, the entire the enormous amount of radiation emitted anywhere. Of course, I don't know what the word observable means anymore because there'll be nobody to observe. Okay. <laughs> but technically, uh, by the laws of physics, yes, that would certainly be a very dramatic event. So you'll be able to observe it. But it hasn't happened. Since it hasn't happened, we assume that at least we are stable enough beyond this 14 billion years. Now, whether it's going to happen in the next billion years, I don't know. And neither you or I will be here to see. But it's possible. Theoretically, it's possible. What's your next question? Uh, so the, the next question is basically related to dark matter. So dark matter uh, interacts via the weak force and gravity, right? So that would mean that uh, dark matter should aggregate uh, inside stars and uh, galaxies. So in that case, uh, so if they form aggregates, uh, would that have an observable effect on uh, the star's uh, life cycle or in, in any way would that be observable? 
Well, it's not there in enough density to change the star's life cycle because the star's life cycle is mostly driven by strong interactions. Okay, so therefore the effect could be very small. However, it certainly affects the gravitational motion of the stars. I mean, that's for example how dark matter was discovered because when you look at the rotation of galaxies, the apparently the far galaxies, you know, stars which are at the edge of galaxies are rotating much faster than they should have been. Rotating, and that's what originally led you to believe that there is more matter in the things than here. So therefore, it does affect them, but whether it will affect their evolution, I think the answer is most probably no, unless dark matter has some very strange properties which we don't know. About. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. So I guess we are done with the questions. So thank you, sir, for the wonderful talk, and thank you for inaugurating the event in such a wonderful way. I guess this talk and the whole discussion session would inspire every one of us, every one of those who are attending, the to do more research, like participate actively in events, and critic the aptitude of research would be developed a bit at least due to this. And I would also like to thank everyone who has taken the effort to come to the auditorium, especially Professor Rajiv Gavi. So he actually came here on a very short notice, and same goes for Professor Rai Choudhury. He agreed for this talk on a very short notice. So very special thanks to him. Uh, and uh, just a general note for everyone that the main event is on 13th and 14th March. So I request everyone to participate in the event, and looking forward for more and more participation. And once again, I would like to thank Professor Rai Choudhury for the talk. And I guess there are a lot more well wishes for you in the chat box as well, sir. Yes, I can so. see that. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. And uh, thank you for the, to the organizers. Thank you so much, sir. So and, uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Yes, and, it was uh, Yes. And uh, I look forward maybe to again talking to uh, Sir Gopal sometime. We do have some friends. And now that Rajiv is there, of course, uh, I'm sure uh, we will have more things to say. And uh, anyway, also good evening, Rajiv. Thank you also for your intro introduction. And let's suppose it's time to say bye and we talk later again at some later stage. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. You can find my uh, email address on the TFR website. You can just look there. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Goodbye. Good evening. Goodbye. Bye bye, sir. Have a good. good.